see. So hello again and welcome. I am Kate Clark LeMay and I use the pronouns she, her. I am the acting senior historian at the National Portrait Gallery and the interim director of Portal, the Portrait Gallery Scholarly Center. Thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation. Fit for a queen, Perkins Harnley, Victorian style and queer identity in mid-century America. This lecture is presented by Sarah Burns, the Emerita Ruth N. Halls, Professor of Art History at Indiana University. And it is followed by a Q&A moderated by Eduardo Ardiles, the founder of the Philadelphia-based architectural, architectural and interior design firm, Studio Edo. Although we are tuning in together today from very different places, which we just saw, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home in these places today. We also recognize that since this nation's founding, who is represented and how one is represented reflects the country's flaws as well as its strengths. The National Portrait Gallery strives to present a more complete narrative, one that acknowledges the history of slavery, racism, and inequality in the United States. We are so pleased to present today's event as part of the Tommy L. Pegas and Donald A. Capocha conversation series. We welcome our viewers to this series, uh, who, as we know, are zooming in from all over the world. Again, please use the chat function and let us know from where you are watching. That would be great. Tommy, who is here with us today, has served as one of the National Portrait Gallery's commissioners since 2015. He and his husband, Don, have been dedicated supporters of the Portrait Gallery since 2008, for which we are so grateful. They are focused on the arts and their continued friendship enables us to further our mission to explore the history of the United States through biography and identity. As I mentioned, um, Tommy is here with us now with his husband. So I would like to invite them to say a few words. Thank you, Kate. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's safe and well. Don and I are honored to sponsor this program as we especially want to continue to create a safe space to discuss critical issues around the LGBTQ plus identity and artistic production. We have enjoyed this series so much as it has provided our viewers with robust conversation around LG issues of LGBT plus identity and promises to continue to do so. I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation, which will explore the life of artist Perkins Harnley. Thank you. Th so thank you all for being here, for your curiosity, and for joining us in the belief that portraiture is powerful. Kate, I will hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Tommy and Don. Now I'd like to um, introduce our moderator for this evening, Eduardo Ardiles. We are so privileged to have him here. He is, like I said, the founder of Studio Edo, an architectural and interior design firm based in Philadelphia that specializes in residential projects, custom furniture, and accessories. His work has been featured in publications such as Architectural Digest, Elle Decor, and Philadelphia Magazine. He is also the founder of Alta Pampa, a textile design and home accessory company based in the Argentina, uh, based in Argentina and the United Kingdom, which is distributed and it's distributed worldwide. Previously, he was a member of the design team at David Collins Studio in London, England. Eduardo is a graduate of the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London and the National School of Music in Buenos Aires. He is a member of the Contemporary Art Committee and was recently appointed a trustee to the main board, both at the Philadelphia Museum of, of, of Art. 
Eduardo is a founding member of Philadelphia Contemporary, an arts organization that commissions and presents contemporary visual art, performance art, and spoken word. We are excited that Eduardo is also serving as co-chair for the Smithsonian's American Portugal to be held here in Washington, DC in November of 2022. And I just wanna say Eduardo is also a friend. He's a lovely person. And I strongly recommend that you follow him on Instagram, uh, not only for all the lovely things that he posts about design, but also because he's a lover of dogs and he posts beautiful things about his newest puppy, Henry. It is also my pleasure to introduce Sarah Burns. Sarah Burns is the Ruth N. Halls Professor of the History of Art Emerita at Indiana University. She's a leading scholar of 19th century American art and popular culture and author of award-winning books, including Painting the Dark Side, Art and the Gothic Imagination in 19th Century America, and Inventing the Modern Artist, Art and Culture in Gilded Age America. She also co-authored with John Davis, a very important collection of primary sources, American Art to 1900, a documentary history. And of course, we are all eagerly awaiting for her, her forthcoming book, which is entitled The Empathetically Queer Career of Artist Perkins Harnley and His Bohemian Friends. She is a great friend as well and a wonderful teacher. And over the years, I have learned an enormous amount from Sarah about American art, as well as about life writ large she is a beloved mentor to many of us in the field of American art, and I can't wait to learn from her today. I'm so excited about tonight's lecture on the mid-century artist, Perkins Harnley, and his experiences exploring the United States and making records of Victorian interiors. Okay, so without further ado, uh, please welcome Sarah Burns. Well, hi everyone. Um, is everything working? Everything's great, Sarah. We can okay. see. You. All right. Here we go. Okay, let me just get this up. Ah, thank you so much. Um, it's a wonderful honor to be part of this portal series. Uh, many thanks to Kate for inviting me and to Eduardo for agreeing to act as moderator. Um, and of course, huge thanks to Tommy and Don for their sponsorship of this series. Before we begin, I wanna give a shout out to Linda Roscoe Hardigan and Virginia Mecklenburg, who in 1981 mounted an exhibition at the then National Museum of American Art of Perkins Harnley's Index of American Design Watercolors. Linda also arranged to take an oral history when Perkins visited the museum for the opening and spearheaded the collection of some of Perkins' papers for the Archives of American Art. If it hadn't been for those efforts, Perkins may well have been lost to history. So there's a lot to be grateful for. One more thing, um, when I use language such as fairy and queen, it shouldn't be taken as pejorative in any way. I'm just quoting Perkins. So, here he is, Perkins Harnley, age 80, goofing it up for his young friend, photographer, Rocky Schenk. In 1980, when he was 79 years old, Perkins met Rocky standing in line at the silent movie theater in Los Angeles, waiting to see Ala Na Nazimova's 1923 film, Salome, an arty avant-garde extravaganza styled after Aubrey Beardsley's illustrations to the Oscar Wilde play and featuring a cast made up in part by drag queens. Curious about the little old man in the bow tie, Rocky struck up a conversation, asking Perkins if he'd ever seen the film before. And Perkins answered, I should say so. I was at the premiere in 1923 and I've wanted to see it again ever since. Perkins Harnley first saw the light in 1901 and he lasted until 1986. Born on a hardscrabble dairy farm in the Nebraska hinterlands, 
He later declared in no uncertain terms how deeply he detested it. I hated the farm where I was born. I hated the all pervading stench of animal dung and I hated milking a cow. I loathed the cow's tits. Oh, how I struggled with those things. They constituted a traumatic experience which took many years to overcome. That however was the least of his traumas. He survived a nightmarish childhood of abuse, violence, then deadly disease, the disintegration of his family, and a stint in reform school where a certain Bert, the handsome husky fry cook, taught Perkins how to be a queen, meaning in the gay parlance of the time, a homosexual attracted to heterosexual males. A self-declared hard-boiled libertine by the age of 16, Perkins went to work as an elevator boy at the state capitol's Lincoln Hotel. This would be during the period of what he called his bitchhood, when he was sexy and beautiful and wore lipstick. In 1918, Perkins had the first of his numerous Zelig-like encounters with his supreme idol, the fabled French actress, Sarah Bernhardt, then on her fourth and finally final farewell tour of the United States. Enchanted by the divine Sarah, Perkins wrote poetry to his goddess and avidly devoured her movies when they came to town. But now, staying at the Lincoln Hotel, here she was in real life, minus her right leg, amputated in 1915. One night, when Perkins was on duty, the elevator broke down and stopped running just as Bernhardt, in a wicker chair, came back from the theater. Her attendant drafted Perkins to help haul the ancient star up four flights of stairs to her room, which he did, all the while getting what he re remembered as a dirty bawling out in French for not handling my side of the chair in a proper manner. The next day, Perkins sneaked into Bernhardt's room at the hotel and in retaliation for the nasty French tongue lashing, filched an entire layer of bonbons from the gorgeous box of chocolates he found there. But even though he derided Bernhardt as a disagreeable old harridan with henna dyed hair and rotten teeth, he never ceased to adore her. And sometimes even signed his letters, nay, Sarah Bernhardt, as if he were Sarah born again, or less respectfully, Sarah Asburn. And every time he went to Paris, he visited her grave in Père Lachaise Cemetery. But Perkins wasn't long for Lincoln. His ticket out of town was Paul Swan then wildly renowned as the most beautiful man in the world, who danced in a tiny leopard skin tunic that caused women to swoon. They met and had a fling when Swan performed in Lincoln in 1922. Soon, the two were on their way to Hollywood, where Swan tried and failed to get the part of Ben-Hur in Cecil B. DeMille's new movie, settling instead for a bit part in DeMille's The Ten Commandments. Perkins, when he wasn't washing dishes at a cafeteria, haunted the wakes, funerals, and grave sites of tragic young jazz age movie stars like Barbara Lamar, often critiquing their makeup and the outfits they were to be buried in. In the early 1930s, Perkins with his dishy friend, Fernando Felix, traveled in Mexico, where he began his artistic career in earnest, seeking out provincial churches and painting watercolors of the hyper-realistic and sumptuously dressed Santos figures he found enshrined within. As a side note, many, many years later, Andy Warhol starred Paul Swan in the eponymous two real film, Paul Swan. Swan also made an appearance in Warhol's camp. 
Perkins spent most of the 1930s in New York, where he won prizes at drag balls, in which he emulated another idol, Mae West, whose voluptuous and sumptuously arrayed body was a cornerstone of his aesthetic and his own transvestite fashion sense. As Perkins put it approvingly in something of a brain twister, one might think of Mae West as being a female impersonating a female impersonator. He even produced a series of drag fashion plates like the one you see here, ensembles for every occasion and every time of day, often with outrageous headgear like this presumably stuffed but wide awake fox, adorning the brim of a vast cartwheel of a hat. Now here is Perkins in his variant Mary Pickford drag. He described this image as Granny Perkins in yards and yards of tulle in a circle of doves, adding for emphasis that the doves were stuffed. Later, Perkins suspended the doves above his bed so that he could wake up and imagine fleetingly that he had died and gone to heaven. Perkins also sojourned for weeks at a time at Carabas Castle, the Westport, Connecticut mansion of artist, author, and suffragist Rose O'Neill, whose creation, the Cupies, in two and three dimensions, were the Hello Kitties of their day, earning her millions of dollars that enabled her to support any number of freeloading poets, painters, composers, and assorted bohemians. Also at Carabas was Rose's pyromaniac brother, Clink, who, as Perkins recalled, believed he was an engineer and kept the fireplace roaring in winter and summer. Regularly, every three weeks, he would set fire to the woods. In addition, according to Perkins, Clink would stand in the corner all day reading a book upside down dress in an all rubber outfit and run around outside the house, peering into the windows. And then he would disrobe and take a scimitar to the roof to chase off dragons. While frolicking at Carabas, Perkins devised his signature image of a corset squeezing a Victorian house to pieces. Its publication, along with Perkins' other Victoriana cartoons, all appearing in Vienna-born raconteur Alexander King's short-lived satirical magazine, Americana. And this launched Perkins' career. The Corset House also embodied Perkins' lifelong obsession with all things Victorian and his embrace of Victoriana just at the time when all things Victorian were under relentless attack. In the early decades of the 20th century, Victorian style, architecture and decor alike, became the target of almost hysterical hostility. A parlor like the one you see here in the stereo card, for example, would be branded an old fashioned chamber of horrors. Writers vied with each other to come up with the most lurid language of condemnation, extending even to out and out scatological put downs, like one critic in 1926, who lamented the state of the countryside, literally be strewn with droppings from the Victorian period. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Tastemakers, accordingly, preached clean, simple decor, commensurate with modern American life, a message reinforced by displays such as the one you see here, uh, the Comparative Arts Exhibition in Phoenix, uh, pointedly contrasting the cluttered, hideous, monstrous, atrocious, rubbishy, unclean, perverted, Victorian interior, all terms then in circulation, with sleek, hygienic, contemporary style. 
Perkins Victorian obsession was rooted in his past. When he had taught himself to draw, he claimed from the Sears Roebuck catalog, especially the lingerie section. His grandfather, Benjamin, built ornate Queen, Ma Queen Anne mansions in Lincoln, including a magnificent pile for himself, which boasted a brick outhouse, the first in the state purportedly. And the house itself was a superb example of what Perkins termed the monstrosity decade. It was constructed of red brick and jigsaw fretwork and wood with delicately fashioned half moons, lace work, spools, spindles, fans, knobs, and machine carved pillows, he said. The structure arose from verandas, bay and dormer windows, past balconies, turrets, and gables to a dome surmounted by ornamental lightning rods. Inside were yet more spindles, fans, knobs, and lacework, plus red glass windows with etched reindeer, enormous floral pattern bases, painted velvet, banners with gold fringe, red flock wallpaper, a Rococo revival power suite, and polar bear rugs. You just turned the inside out or the outside in, and it was the same thing. Awful, awful, awful stuff, you know, he said, only half jokingly. Awful or not, Grandfather Benjamin's Queen Anne fripperies became the building blocks of Perkins's art. And he crammed them all into his cartoony illustrations for Americana. If architecture is frozen music, Perkins wrote, then American construction after the Civil War presented a concert of congealed breakdowns, Virginia reels, sailor's hornpipes, and highland flings, not to speak of cakewalks and campaigns. Through Alexander King, Perkins gained entree into Julian Levy's fledgling surrealist gallery on Madison Avenue and was included in the same December 1933 group show as Joseph Cornell, who, as we know, ultimately went on to become as famous as Perkins became obscure. But Perkins's Victorian fantasies upstaged Cornell, attracting considerable bemused attention. One critic marveled, it is as though some long forgotten theatrical storehouse had disgorged its contents for Mr. Harmley's especial benefit. And the collection of curiosities he has painted is truly amazing. Quilted couches, ancient stoves and filigree chandeliers, picture display easels, antiquated sewing machines and deer horn chairs, all are among the weird paraphernalia which he serves up in his pictures. Um, and note here in the, this is kind of a spoopy exhibition announcement in which, as you can see, he gave himself the very, very top billing. Um, then there was Toulouse Lautrec and Harry Brown and then objects by Cornell way at the bottom. Such rooms were the natural habitat of gay 90s ladies in their enormous plumed hats, hourglass corsets, lace-up boots and fancy furled parasols. Perkins dubbed such figures variously as fat queens, whores, or more politely, Bella Flowers. And now for something completely different. Two years after his show at the Levy Gallery, Perkins was hired on to the Index of American Design to produce a series of watercolors depicting Victorian and Edwardian interiors. The Index of American Design was a unit of the New Deal's WPA Federal Art Project that employed hundreds of artists to record objects deemed representative of the nation's cultural heritage and the history of American decorative arts. With emphasis on pre-industrial craft and folk art, the index's mandate was to produce renderings of chosen objects as accurate and meticulously realistic as was humanly possible 
in order to achieve a camera-like precision. Even though most of the artists signed their work, the idea was to suppress the least trace of individual expression in the service of uber realism. Surely though, looking at these, wouldn't you think the same painter must have produced these two renderings? Nope. These two stylistically identical watercolors of 18th century case pieces are actually the work of two different artists. And in this context, I can't help but be reminded of that old ad campaign, which probably younger people don't remember, in which identical twins with identical hairstyles challenged readers to guess which one had the expensive beauty salon permanent and which one used the more affordable Tony home permanent. Which twin has the Tony? And then all of a sudden Perkins crashed the party. His index watercolors are as individualistic and idiosyncratic as the high and low boys are utterly impersonal. In contrast to the meticulous precision of standard index style, Perkins's townhouse parlor, only his second, a painting for the index, expresses personality in every object, every line. It's as exuberant, excessive, and energetic as the high and low boys are static, sterile, and staid. And I can guarantee that you won't find another polar bear rug like this, just to mention one detail, in the index's entire 18,000 odd inventory of images. And there's Queen Victoria you know, overlooking the scene. So here you see three of Perkins's characteristic domestic interiors, composites from many different sources, including, of course, the Sears robot catalog. You could spend many, many minutes cataloging all the things in these rooms, the busy patterned wallpaper, the festoons of drapery and lace, spindles and knobs and tortuously carved wood, peacock feathers, a parlor organ, there it is right there. Ornate light fixtures, fringes, tassels, furbelows, and frilly bows, no surface left unembellished. These rooms epitomize the muchness, excess, and gaudy flamboyance deplored by the enemies of industrial age Victoriana and exultantly embraced by Perkins. We might think of Perkins' interiors as rooms in drag overstuffed, over-ornamented, be-plumed and bedizened in a regular orgy of overload. The inhabitants of Perkins index rooms never appear, but he often left a bread trail of clues. Let's look closely at boudoir. Like the other interiors, this one is sumptuous in the extreme with its vivid blue and gold color notes. The chaise longue bedecked with tassels, bolsters, and fringe, the sweeping swaths of drapery, those ruffled pink lampshades that could pass for hats, the gleeful elaboration of every surface. On the little bow legged table is a bouquet of fading white roses and an empty champagne coupe. Underneath, a neat stack of naughty books, Fanny Hill the Decameron and Balzac's droll stories. A box of bonbons lies nearby on the rug. A large picture easel displays the portrait of a glamorous woman. There's a French flag attached to the frame and on the wall above a painting of a ship in full sail with a sailor's cap hanging jauntily from one corner. So far, so good. The boudoir must be a love nest. She's waiting for her lover's return from the high seas. But wait a minute, here's something else. Tossed carelessly upon and around the dressing table stool are a pair of black lace stockings and a pair of high heel shoes, one of them with a hole in the sole. Is the lady a streetwalker? 
Or has she merely worn out her shoe leather pacing the aisles of department stores? Or are these articles of clothing something else entirely? Perkins's index interiors may have been unpopulated, but in many other paintings, as we've already seen in Stylish Stout, he included what he dubbed a fat queen posing as an American beauty, always sporting lacy black thigh high stockings. The stockings are a signal to those in the know that appearances to the contrary, Perkins's buxom women are not necessarily female. How can we be sure? One of Perkins' drawings depicts a graveyard with a coffin from which a plump leg in a black lace stocking protrudes as if the undead occupant is trying to make a break for it before being interred beneath the nearby Harnley Monument with its trumpet blowing angel. Perkins himself is surely the fat queen, his imaginary alter ego or projection whose traces everywhere in the boudoir and in several more of Perkins' index Victorian interiors in which items such as huge hats, frilly parasols and elbow length gloves function as stand-ins for the queen herself. Fantasized spaces that carried the aesthetic of rampant excess to extremes, Perkins' Victorian rooms, campy rooms, rooms in drag were places where he could dream of being she. But in the context of the index, there's another question. How on earth did Perkins land that job? Meet Lloyd LePage Rollins, a graduate of Harvard's museum program, who in the mid 1930s handled allocations of federal art project works to schools, hospitals, and other public institutions. Perkins described Rollins as an old queer who collected Victorian stuff, notably swirl glass and mustache cups of which he had a house full. Another acquaintance reported that Rollins' Burry Hill apartment was growing more and more crowded with Victorian furniture and bric-a-brac, including an interesting collection of old shaving mugs and even an attractive pet Scotchman too. Perkins could hardly have wished for a better sponsor. More than likely, Rollins pulled some strings to get Perkins a place in the index's artistic stable. As Perkins recalled, that old fairy was very clever and very good, adding that Rollins had helped him a great deal. But Perkins and Rollins' shared passion for Victoriana raises another question. Was there anything inherently queer about Victorian decor? Or to put it another way, why was Victoriana queer? Perhaps the fact that the moderns relentlessly spurned and savaged Victorian style played a role. Perkins and like-minded connoisseurs embraced all those outmoded sofas and bell jars because those things like homosexuals were hidden away in attics or closets, thrown onto the junk heap, reviled and mercilessly mocked. The flamboyant piano performer Liberace, for one, had an almost maternal concern for the old things that he rescued and loved. They don't really belong to me, they belong to the world, he said. Somewhere, somehow, they had been abandoned and not cared for. Then I came along and saw a broken chair or a forgotten antique that cried out to be saved. Now the taste for Victoriana didn't necessarily connote gay, of course, but in the 1930s and after, many gay men embraced it with a passion or perhaps with ambivalence. Just a few examples, Perkins' friend, Whitney Norcross Morgan, Harvard product and blue blood, who avidly collected Victorian furniture and decor and daydreamed about opening an antique shop. Southern painter, Hobson Pittman, 
who migrated to Philadelphia and lived as a boarder for many years with the elderly Sarah Cotter, his so-called Aunt Nanny, in her house full of Victorian antiques, which appeared in Pittman's nostalgic paintings of yesteryear in Dis Dixieland. And naturally, Grant Wood, possibly more ambivalent, whose attitude toward Victoriana combined mockery and nostalgia in equal measure. For such men, Victorian interiors could become havens and distinctive emblems of identity. Within them, it was possible to evade the censorious and often treacherous world outside and become simply one's own queer self. And for Perkins too, Victorian style was his metaphorical closet a place where interior decor itself was a form of drag, its rampant and vulgar excess, the campy equivalent of the artist's own lavish, sartorial and lustful, or at least lusty, flights of fancy. Perkins returned to Los Angeles in 1943 to work as a sketch artist on the production of Albert Lewin's film, the picture of Dorian Gray, and Lewin was inspired by an exhibition of Perkins's index watercolors that took place on the mezzanine of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1943. Lewin commissioned Perkins to continue his Index of American Design series with 38 more watercolors of interiors from the late 19th century to the 1940s. And they were added to the Index of American Design Collection, and all 63 paintings may be seen online at the National Gallery of Arts website. And they have, it's an excellent, excellent um, site, and you can zoom in and see all kinds of details. Perkins quit the movie business, ultimately ending up as a hot counter supply man at the upscale Entree Cafeteria for 37 years. Here, as you see, he, in the middle, is cutting up in a chorus line with his young cafeteria colleagues, the three disgraces. Along the way, Perkins crossed paths with many more famous and infamous people. After an extended moratorium, he resumed painting later in life and became sort of famous. There's a lot more to tell, but that's another story. For now, will end with the apotheosis of Perkins's fat queen. Angels are striving to lift her up to heaven, but as Perkins commented, she seems indifferent to their struggles, not giving a damn if she reaches the golden gates or not. Evidently, St. Peter is not overjoyed by her appearance upward, for his gates are closed. Below on the ground level stands her couch of abomination. And I think it's probably a safe bet to assume that the fat queen, AKA Perkins, wouldn't be all that sorry if the angels gave up and lowered her back onto that abomination of gilded, curvy, draped, bolstered, and betasseled bed of muchness, her bed of dreams. Well, that's all folks, and thanks for coming. Okay, here we go. Sarah, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, thank you. I, uh, I love the whole story. Um, and there is also, a, you know, part of his personal story that, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, his um, Perkins um, fascination with politics and with Reagan and parts that, you know, would be very, um, uh, I mean, I mean, I think they're very, very interesting uh, as a gay person as well, you know. Um, and uh, I love the quote that you mentioned, "rooms in drag," because 
uh, if you um, look at these rooms and if you look at the process of uh, a drag queen getting ready uh, are very similar. You know, it's like layer upon layer upon layer. I mean, it's, it's literally exhausting when you see uh, these guys, um, you know, getting ready. And so uh, uh, the same thing happens with this, uh, with this Victorian rooms. You know, uh, there is nothing, there's not a single corner of the room that gets unattended. And if it's, and everything is heavy and everything is layer upon layer, and it is drapery, as you mentioned, is fabric and it's tassels and it's fringes and it's, you know, three, four layers. Um, the rooms, I think also, uh, and I, I will answer some questions uh, soon. Uh, you know, the rooms are also very oppressive. Uh, not in his paintings though. I think he, um, he's very detailed. It's amazing to me that he achieves those details in watercolor. Um, and also he uses a very light um, palette of, of colors, like almost like pastels sometimes, which is not very Victorian, you know, with, with that they were very like burgundy or, you know, um, uh, deep greens, uh, you know, dark uh, woods. Um, so uh, he makes them look in a way um, more joyful. Uh, and I love that. So, okay, let's look at the questions. Uh, let me see. There are a lot of questions for you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Hope I can answer some of them. Yeah, uh, so um, they want to know, for example, what, what was um, um, Harley's um, artistic uh, training or background, uh, if he had any. I think he was self-taught, right? But I don't know. Yeah, yeah, he was self-taught. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the talk, he swore that he learned to draw from the Sears Roebuck mail order catalog. Yeah. So yeah, he did it all, you know, just in a bootstrappy way, I guess. But he had no formal training at all. Yeah. Um, and I read that he was self-taught since, I mean, he started uh, drawing and, and since a very early age. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's another one that is very interesting. It says, um, can you give us a sense of how queer, a queer person existed in society in the 30s and 40s America? Well, um, it was a it was a tricky business, I think, um, because essentially, you know, as as people who study gay history in 20th century America during that period, um, homosexuality was something considered to be, you know, perverted and unnatural, and you know, basically. Um, something that needed to be suppressed. And um, at the same time, there was, especially in places like New York um, and Los Angeles to some degree later, there's like this whole yeah. parallel life that queer people are living in which you know they're just sort of off the normative radar. And as long as they keep those tracks parallel, everything's fine. But yeah. if you know the normative world and the gay world intersect, then um, you know there's danger. Uh, yeah. There were raids, and you know, the, the, for a while in the 1920s in the jazz age, you know, all the socialites went to the to the drag balls, the Harlem drag balls. Perkins mm -hmm. went to Atlantic City drag balls. Um, it was kind of like a, a the thing to do. But in the 1930s, there was kind of a backlash, and um, more and more. You know, gay people went well into their closets or underground. So, so it was it was really extremely uh, difficult and painful, I think, to try to live as a queer person in a very straight world. Yeah, and you can trace a little bit of that in his, um, you know, in the way he moved in in his life. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how he ends up in in Hollywood at some point where. 
I think, you know, like you mentioned before, Hollywood, I mean, Los Angeles, New York, those big cities probably were the safest places to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but even though, um, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't be completely out. Um, there is another one uh, that is interesting. That there is, you know, there's a lot of about when your book is coming out or links or stuff like that. But um, do you have any idea of how much one of his paintings uh, is worth today? Um, they're really, they're really affordable. Um, a lot of them are in private collections, and then there's the major body of work in the National Gallery. Um, but I've just noticed, you know, many times they're on the art market, they're auctioned off, um, and the prices I should buy one, I guess, because they're really <laughs> cheap, like $1,200, $1,500, sometimes oh. in the hundreds. Um, so they just, you know, they pop up from time to time. And, um, you know, they're, they're certainly uh, attractively priced at this point. Yeah, and they're usually uh, like small-ish size, right? They are around two feet by two feet or something like that, or there's a bigger ones. The ones I've they're, seen mm -hmm. on are usually that size, but I don't know. Well, they're, um, you know, they're fairly big. I mean, okay. they're not huge. They're about, you know, probably less less than a easel size oil painting, but, um, you know, he used one of those really, you know, big pads of watercolor paper. Yeah. And I should have the measurements, but I don't. Um, but you know, they, they would, they're not tiny. Oh, they're, okay. Yeah. Which makes sense actually because of the, uh, of the details that they have mm -hmm. uh, in them. And I, I thought what you said about Eduardo, about the Victorian, actual Victorian interiors, which are dark, you know, with all those dark, you know, like heavily saturated colors and how Perkins's interiors are, even though they're very busy, you know, they're, they're just full of light and very lively, which is pertinent because um, uh, some of the criticism of Victoriana in the 20s and 30s has to do with these houses being so dark and so oppressively, you know, dim. Yes. And, and you know, that also has to do with uh, the Victorian proportions of those houses. I love that image that you have by him where he kind of squeezes a house, a Victorian house inside a corset because that's kind of what Victorian proportions were, you know, uh, um, squeezed and enlarged. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And that's, I think, um, subsequent, you know, in the, uh, in the back of our mind that would make eventually some noise because we are used to classic proportions mm -hmm. in the country. So, you know, like even like the paper we put on the printer, you know, the letterhead and the golden rule. So all of a sudden, even if you don't have a trained eye, because we've seen this since we're, you know, infants, um, it's, in the, it's, it's in the back of your head. So as soon as you see something that your eye that doesn't respond to that proportion, uh, you know, creates a little bit of a conflict. And that's also the reason why these houses didn't have that much light inside, uh, besides, you know, all the, all the uh, window treatments. Uh, but, and you know, and the whole, um, and the whole other thing of these houses being uh, linked somehow to being haunted or, you know, being used in horror movies by, you know, mm -hmm. like Psycho by uh, Hitchcock or even in a funny note like the Adams Family, mm -hmm. which, you know, actually, if you remember that is exactly what a Victorian uh, interior would look like. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, and then it's interesting how um, movies, you know, Hitchcock um, um, also create, you know, kind of um, enhances these proportions by the use of the camera, you know, placing the camera very low, almost, almost on a vertical angle. Oh, so yeah. 
uh, this becomes like even uh, these images become like they're they're haunting you. They're coming, you know, they're being like almost on top of you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, which is kind of, um, you know, I, I, I would like, I, I, I would like to, you know, if, if I, uh, uh, you know, see Perkins, I would like to ask him why his fascination with this, when, you know, um, usually queer people are, um, are usually looking ahead or creating the new style that is, is coming. Uh, but he actually decided to look backwards and study in a very detailed way, not only the interiors, but also the lifestyle that happened inside these rooms, you know, and he mm -hmm. turned to the story with, like you described so beautifully, uh, with all the elements that um, you can see around, you know, and you can build probably two or three different stories. I don't think, you know, that lady mm -hmm. is waiting for, um, uh, her lover. I think she's already with another lover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can buy that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, that's that's the beauty of it. So, yeah. Let's see. Uh, so this is interesting. Uh, he says, oh, was he financially successful to live comfortably? Not at all. Um, he, he really scraped a living. Uh, and, and in fact, he, he himself defined his identity, you know, his, his identity as a working person. He always insisted that he was just a laborer and you know, that art was something he did on the side. Uh, so many of his jobs, with the exception of the Dorian Gray period, which was really pretty brief, he worked um, in a in a stove manufacturing plant in Los Angeles after he you know, quit the movie business, and then landed this job at the Entree Cafeteria, where he worked really really hard um, and got paid very very little. Yeah. He had a show in San Francisco in 1969. However, which netted him, I think, seven thousand huh. dollars, and um, with that, he took the first of his seven voyages to Europe and South America in the nineteen seventies. But um, you know, he 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 was very frugal. Um, you know, he he made delicious dish, dishes out of carrot tops and <laughs> onions, <laughs> and uh, yeah, really, he lived a humble humble life. And he was, um, and he ended up um, his days taken care of by a, a couple, right? A friend of yeah. Tom Huckabee and his wife, Barbara Cohen, yeah. uh, who were friends of Rocky Shank, the photographer, who met yeah. Perkins in line at Salome. And um, they were also friends with the late actor, Bill Paxton. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, they just loved Perkins. They turned him into this old man pet. And, um, you know, they were just incredibly kind to him. So we have a lot to be grateful to them because a lot of old yeah. young people don't spend much time, you know, really caring for their grandpa aged. Yeah, and they, and um, they, and they talk about him like he was delightful even when he was, you know, um, in a lot of discomfort of, or pain yeah. at the end of his life. Uh, he always tried to keep up a good friend. Yes. Uh, well, uh, so Elena Jewell asked, uh, was he painting for all his life? Uh, well, um, that's an interesting question because he took what he called later on, you know, his, he had this amnesia period starting after he did the second bunch of index watercolors for Albert Lewin, um, for unexplained reasons, he, he simply stopped painting for about 20 years, 15, 20 years. 
And it was only when Alexander King, whom you see here in the gay 90s shot, he, he, he serendipitously bumped into Alexander King again around 1961, 62. And King, was just raring to get Perkins an exhibition, you know, in Los Angeles or New York. And, and it was through King's encouragement that Perkins started to paint again. And uh, he painted a lot. Tom Huckabee thinks that uh, Perkins was an insomniac because he just was so productive. And not only that, but he wrote these not very good novels um, and thousands of letters. So, but, you know, so he had plenty to do when he wasn't painting, but then he started painting again and um, his exhibition. Uh, and you know, um, Elena also asked if by any chance we know if his first painting was a commission. No, no, he did pretty much everything on spec. Yeah. Right. Um, Then um, there's another question that is interesting is, uh, is how might the notion of camp apply to his work? Mm. Well, that, that's, I think that's a, a really interesting question um, because he often talks about things being a camp or campy. And, and so I think that, you know, the word camp applies very aptly to his work, to his style. You know, if we think about camp, as a as a mode of you know sort of exaggeration, artifice, artifice of decor, you know, surfaces and textures dominating over everything else. I mean that was Susan Sontag's beef with camp, I suppose, was mm -hmm. that it was all about style and not about context and meaning. Um, and I think there's plenty of context and meaning in, in Perkins's interiors, but but they are very deliberately and quite consciously campy, I think in that you know it's this sort of willful and gleeful exaggeration making everything more and more and more yeah which makes uh, totally sense with you know his work and his fascination for victorian interiors and mm -hmm. yeah and you can tell also you know he he loved to dress up he uh, he was a master uh, i mean that that picture that you have that you show of uh may west Mm -hmm. uh, that's incredible. Um, oh yeah. Hi, Kate. Picture. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to break in to end this because what a what an incredible uh, you know history for all of us to understand Perkins Harnley through Sarah's study, and also to have Eduardo's you know point of view from the design perspective. Um, I think it's a uh, I really appreciate both of your time and, and your comments today, your presentation, both of you. Um, and unfortunately, I have the job of closing us out. Um, oh, but I did, <laughs> I did want to, fun. yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. Well, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. Eduardo, thanks so much for your comments. And oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, it's just been yeah, I would love to stay for hours and discuss all this. It's just incredible. I think we all would. Um, and so go buy Sarah's book. And Sarah, tell us again, when does it come out? Oh, when is it published? It's being published by Process, and um, it's going to be released in early September this early year. Early September. OK. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I put a Google sort of search on it, because I don't think we're allowed to promote anything. But I right. That's I why I didn't show the cover. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that people will find it. Yeah. Um, and uh, before we end, I do need to um, put a plug for our next lecture. Uh, I'd like to invite you to join us again on Tuesday, May 4th at 5 p.m. Uh, for the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture for a talk entitled A Closer Look, Photographs, Conservation at the National Portrait Gallery which will be presented by the Portrait Gallery's very own conservator, photographs conservator, Christina Finlayson, who is amazing. She does all this incredible behind the scenes work. Um, and she will be in conversation with Leslie Urenia, who's the curator of photographs at the National Portrait Gallery and one of my esteemed colleagues. 
Um, so Leslie will moderate the Q&A after Christina presents. So we hope that you can join us. And thank you again, everyone, for, for tuning in today.